House Energy Policy Committee will come to order. Clerk will call the roll, please. Mr. Chair? Here. Representative Howe? Here. Merritt? Cole? Here. Keeble? Petter? Here. Leo? Here. Farrington? Here. Griffin? Here. Johnson? Here. Fave? Here. Lauer? Here. Riley? Here. Lazinski? Here. Dianda? Here. Garrett? Camilleri? Here. Elder? Here. Green? Here. Mr. Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And, Mr. Clerk, I appreciate your uh, accidentally. No, seriously, I appreciate that. That's what I would have wanted you to do to call uh, Representative Keeble's name. And before we say anything else this morning, I just want to express my condolences to his family. Those of you who have been regular attendees uh, know he was an active and energetic part of this committee. And uh, we are all very saddened by what happened last week. And uh, we're going to miss him. Uh, and I would like to offer this opportunity to Representative DeAnda to make some additional comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's very sad to have my brother not sitting next to me from the UP. So, John, for all of us up there, God bless you and your family. I just want to say this. John was very always interested to make sure that the UP had a voice. And now we're only down, instead of three, we're down to two here in this room. And John always was very interested to in getting the prices down in the UP. So we're going to be on that quest for my other colleague from the South to be able to do that, Mr. Chairman. So thank you for letting us recognize John. Thank you. Thank you, Representative DeAnda. Oh, and uh, Vice Chair Lisinski, if you would also like to make some comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we will miss John, miss his insight as a freshman, and a lot of us on this committee are freshmen. Um, we are always very grateful for the uh, experience and expertise and the generosity of sharing of that um, from our more senior representatives. And John was always open in sharing with his with his caring and his concern and his honor for the institution, and we will miss that every day. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Lisinski. It was not by accident that the three members of the Upper Peninsula delegation were on this committee because of how important this issue is to residents of the UP and Representative uh, DeAnda and Representative Fave. The burden of uh, carrying that forward falls on you. We are glad to have you on the committee, and we'll certainly miss having the third uh, that we've had the pleasure of serving with for the last. Uh, six months on this committee and for those of us who are coming have come back uh, the two years before that any other member of the committee like to uh, say anything on that if you would please join me in a moment of silence please thank you it's our pleasure today to have the CEO of Consumers Energy Ms. Patty Poppy before the committee and uh, I've learned from experience that I think members of the committee are not going to have any problem keeping the, filling the entire 90 minutes with questions. And I understand Ms. Poppy is prepared to speak for 10 or 15 minutes uninterrupted. Uh, and then after that, the committee members' questions will drive the remaining uh, hour and 15 minutes. So, uh, Ms. Poppy, and if, at, what, at some point I understand you want uh, other officials of the company to join you during the Q&A. That's great. And we certainly look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, and my condolences to the committee. I know that this is a, a difficult day uh, back in your first uh, hearing after losing your friend and colleague. Uh, thank you, Chairman Glenn, Vice Chairs Hauk and Lasinski. Appreciate the opportunity to be here on behalf of my coworkers and our customers. Uh, it really is my uh, privilege to spend some time with you today talking about this very important um, uh, industry and its effect on Michigan. You know, uh, I don't intend to do a commercial for Consumers Energy here from this desk. None of us have time for that, but we have left some flyers for you about the impact that we have on each of your districts. Uh, we're an important part of the state and uh, we hope that we serve you well. Uh, but what I do want to talk about is the opportunity that exists for us at this time. And so um, I need to take a little bit, uh, a trip down memory lane here. We're going to do a little bit of history, so bear with me, uh, just to shape why we are where we are today. And it goes back to the very earliest days of our industry. Uh, back in the late 1800s, uh, our founder, along with other innovators and um, entrepreneurs and uh, inventors, realized we could harness 
electricity, and it could make a huge difference for the people's quality of life and our businesses all around Michigan. And so even our own uh, founder, W.A. Foote, was one of those original innovators, and he was the first, he and his brother, to demonstrate that electricity could be transmitted long distances. And so they actually uh, were one of the first to demonstrate from the Trowbridge Dam to Kalamazoo, 27 miles, that electricity could be actually delivered that distance. And so they started up the generator up at Trowbridge, and then they had to send a guy on a horse from Kalamazoo back to Trowbridge to let them know the lights were on in Kalamazoo. Uh, so it's early days, and uh, it was a little bit like the wild, wild west. It was in those days that you would see photographs of uh, parallel infrastructure built, multiple sets of poles, multiple sets of conductor, all serving the same neighborhood. And uh, it was realized then that local communities needed to issue franchises so that we didn't duplicate the infrastructure and double the cost of implementing this important infrastructure for the state. Well, fast forward to the late 1920s, early 1930s. By that time, all of those local franchises had consolidated into eight huge holding companies. We were actually part of a holding company called Commonwealth Southern that served people from Michigan all the way to Georgia. Eight holding companies controlled 75% of the energy distribution in the nation. And those companies uh, were profit maximizing models and acted more like pyramids and there was a lot of cost shifting and not very much transparency. So the federal government passed legislation in 1935 called the Public Utility Holding Company Act, PUCA to break up those big holding companies because they didn't think that they provided the transparency required for such vital infrastructure. So it was in 1935 that state uh, allocations were made to service territories. And it was in 1935 that Consumers Power and Detroit Edison then were granted the franchises in Michigan and divided by the services that we were serving within that great Commonwealth Southern Company. So it was at that time that they determined that state regulation was a model that could hold people more locally accountable and have more direct and local oversight over, to the, prices, over the prices charged and the service provided to local communities. Well then, we went into the great economic boom, and certainly Michigan participated in that. By 1950, Consumers Power at the time had powered uh, 100,000 farms across Michigan in the uh, attempt to electrify our rural communities and power our agricultural industries. And we had powered more farms than any other state in the nation. In parallel, at the very same time, our industrial boom was taking place as a result of the auto industry and all of its suppliers and the post-war baby boom. So in Michigan, demand for electricity was going through the roof. And to meet that demand, we built huge uh, power plants. And it was the lowest cost way to deliver electricity to this booming demand for electricity. Big central station power plants with transmission and distribution lines, building out that infrastructure. Consumers Power alone from 1950 to 1970 invested $12 billion in today's dollars in just power plant infrastructure during that time. Fast forward to today. We believe we're at an inflection point in our industry. Those very same power plants that served Michigan so well are retiring as a natural end of life. Our demand is growing at a much slower pace, though it is still growing, but it's very slow. It used to be that electricity demand grew at two times GDP. Now electricity growth is about 25% of GDP because appliances are more efficient, buildings are more efficient, lighting is more efficient. All of these efficiencies result in a slower demand and a retiring supply. We are at a great moment in time for Michigan. We have an opportunity to right size our generation to match our supply and grow it in a more modular form. Here's the good news. We want what you want. Our company wants Michigan to grow. Our company has a designated geographic territory that does not make us lazy or complacent or wanting to jack up prices. The prices on whom we would be jacking, the people on whom we'd be jacking up their prices are our friends and our families. My father's a retiree of our company and lives two doors down and trust me, I consider him as much as I consider General Motors when we're discovering how do we want to best serve our load, replace this aging infrastructure, but do it at the lowest cost possible. Our sustainability of our business model depends on Michigan growing. So just like the rest of us want Michigan to grow and to thrive, that is the only way 
that my company can succeed is when Michigan is growing. And I've, I've been following your hearings. I'm very impressed with your uh, uh, persistence to learn and understand. I know many of you are new to this industry. Given the variety of things that are on your desks as uh, state legislators, to tackle this committee uh, took some real uh, courage. And I've been impressed with the quality of your questions. One of the questions I hear you discussing and considering is the difference between federal regulatory constructs and state regulation. And I use those very words very deliberately. Federal regulatory constructs are in the absence of state regulation. And so back when PUCA was passed, there was an agency formed called the Federal Power Commission. It was subsequently in 1977 replaced by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. You'll hear it referred to as FERC. FERC is responsible for regulating any state that does not have a state regulatory construct. So because electricity is such a vital piece of infrastructure, and a vital part of both commerce and our economy, it's impossible for that to be deregulated. So when people say the words deregulated, what it really represents is a transition from that local authority to federal authority. And I would just like to describe for you what we think some of the risks are in having federal oversight of this incredibly important infrastructure. I'm just going to use a story as a form of uh, explaining what we, we worry about. Uh, Montana uh, is, a, is a great example of a state that attempted deregulation. In 1997, the state of Montana, the utility executives actually lobbied the state legislature to deregulate. Now, why would utility executives there lobby to deregulate when we are so adamant that state regulation is so good for Michigan. Their mindset was that with state regulation, the prices they could charge were controlled. Their profits were essentially uh, capped. They wanted to deregulate so they could have double-digit earnings growth and participate in the uh, internet boom of the late 1990s, if you remember. So in 1997, the state of Montana agreed to deregulate their electric uh, industry. As a result, Montana Power sold their power plants, used the proceeds to buy a telecom company, and subsequently went bankrupt. The power company that the independent power producers who purchased those power plants were able to charge whatever they wanted in Montana because the state had turned over authority to FERC. When prices went through the roof, the, reg the regulators realized, or the legislators realized they had made a big mistake. And so they re-regulated in Montana the power industry and essentially had to buy back or rebuild those same power plants and the people of Montana, in all essence, paid for those same assets twice. And if you can imagine, it would be very difficult for a company to convince itself to locate in Montana when they're going through that kind of churn and that kind of transition. It creates real uncertainty in a business environment. We would argue that Michigan is on a roll. We are your front line on economic development. In fact, very often we're the first call. I know you're all familiar with switch data systems who came to Grand Rapids, and the legislature certainly did their part by passing the sales use tax. And there's a debate about whether that was a good or bad thing. But what I can tell you is long before they talked about tax policy, they wanted to know the price of electricity in Michigan. Because for switch data systems, their number one expense is electricity. They found our prices competitive. They were looking at all states east of the Mississippi, and they picked Michigan for a couple reasons. One was the low cost of electricity and the availability to additionality and locality of renewable resources. They get a lot of pressure from NGOs, uh, non-government organizations, environmental groups to offset their use because they're such heavy electricity users. They offset 100% of their use with renewables. And we at Consumers Energy could work with them to provide exactly what they were looking for. Similarly, General Motors, they make trucks in Texas. They make trucks in Indiana. They make trucks in Mexico. But they chose to add a body shop and a paint shop to Flint truck plant because if our energy prices were so high, they have choices. They chose Michigan. They chose to expand here and grow here. We would argue that Michigan is, has momentum. And the energy policy was passed at the end of 2016, provides a framework for us to work together to choose how we want our energy infrastructure to look and work for our growing businesses, job creators, and our families here in Michigan. 
I hear some people talk about the energy law was passed in, in the dark of the night and nobody knew what they were signing on to. What I can share with you is uh, that legislation was in the work for years. I sat at this very table over three years ago testifying to the committee members who sat before you who were the original crafters of that initial legislation. The Senate Energy Committee um, worked for years crafting that legislation to get the kind of bipartisan support that it received from a wide stretch of interests was a lot of hard work. And we have an opportunity, a choice really at hand to take sort of a risky reset and turn the keys over to the federal government and the FERC to regulate our industry or continue the momentum. You know, each of you took a bold step when you ran for office. You put your reputations on the line. You made calls. You sent mailers. You promised your communities that you'd make a difference for them. And they picked you. They selected you to come and represent them, and we do too. We think together we have a great opportunity. Passing the legislation was step one. Step two is implementing it and creating a stable policy that attracts businesses. We do not believe it's time to turn our keys over to the Fed. We want to keep our hands on the wheel and our foot on the gas and keep Michigan moving forward. And we think we do that best together with people like yourselves who care about Michigan. With that, Chair, if you uh, will permit, I'd like to invite uh, some colleagues to join me at the table. You bet, Ms. Poppy. And I have uh, Timothy Sparks and Brandon Hoffmeister, I believe it is. Brandon Gentlemen. is our Vice President of Government and uh, Public Affairs, and Tim is our Vice President of Energy Supply. I wanted to make sure there wasn't any questions you might have that we couldn't answer, and so I brought the smartest guys I know, and uh, we, we're happy to answer anything that's on your minds and further illuminate this very complex uh, subject in industry. Thank you, Ms. Poppy, uh, for enlightenment of the members of the committee. Uh, the legislation on which you testified three years ago was never brought up for a vote because it couldn't win the support of the House Republican Caucus. And the legislation that the Senate passed was gutted and rewritten in the dark of the night by a young man in his underwear in a hotel room in San Francisco. Uh, to win the support of uh, those of us who supported electricity choice and nobody had the opportunity to read the final product because we got it at about 11 a.m. and voted on it at about 2 I think 230 page bill uh, I think Representative Geis claims that she did actually read it in that time frame but I think she's the only one who <laughs> she said she was a public school teacher and thus was used to reading a lot of material uh, and said she did have an opportunity to read it um, I have some questions, uh, especially given your comments about economic development. About two months ago, and what I've been told is that you guys have done a good job of addressing it so far, but I want you to elaborate on it and let us know what you did. But the Home Builders Association, about two months ago, was in a frenzy because they said that they had completed construction projects, homes, commercial, etc., that sat for as long as six weeks. Uh, having already been constructed without power because consumers in particular had failed to get and apparently there's some kind of standard you attempt to comply with of two weeks but it was as much as six and somebody shared with me the worst case I heard was that a church had been constructed and sat empty for four months simply waiting to be hooked up so since new ho home construction commercial construction is such a key indicator of economic development when we're talking weeks and weeks and months that becomes pretty sensitive if our lack of ability to simply hook people up any, in any way depresses new construction and economic development. So can you address what steps you've taken to correct that? You bet. And it's a great question, and I think it's actually a great indicator of the momentum that I was describing. We are feeling momentum, and it's growth that we hadn't felt in years prior. We've, in fact, doubled the number of uh, new requests this year over last year, and so uh, that uh, surprised us. And we have been implementing, actually, a lean operating system, um, much like uh, our, our 
customers in our automotive industry has done for decades. We are in the early stages of implementing a lean operating system that allows us to see our uh, workload ahead of time as opposed to being more reactive. In the past we've been more reactive so we're working actively to transform how we deliver our work on time and on the customer's requested date. Uh, we've seen dramatic improvements since then but we're still dissatisfied and we would never want to be the bottleneck and when we are caught by surprise by the growth that I'm describing it's exactly that growth that we want to continue uh, and accelerate by making Michigan's uh, policy construct stable so that we can continue to do and improve our business. Thank you, Ms. Poppy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to refer to the period from 2000-2008 as being the John Engler model when everybody in Michigan was free to choose where they bought their electricity. Our electricity rates were below the national average. I think we were fourth lowest in the Midwest. Um, and people were free to choose. And I think the maximum percentage that ever did choose to buy from somebody other than consumers and DTE was about 18%. So it wasn't much of the market. But still, for somebody who believes that competition drives prices down, what actually happened seems to have validated that. And then in 2008, under the Grand Home Administration, 90% of the market was re-regulated, re-monopolized, given to you guys as a guaranteed share of the market. So that was reaffirmed in the vote last December to continue that 90% monopoly market and 10% choice market. So since 2008, that's the environment, the regulatory climate in which we've operated. And this uh, document uh, was presented last week to the Commerce and Trade Excuse, yeah, Commerce and Trade Committee, on which I sat last uh, term. I remember getting a copy, and you maybe have already seen this because it identifies consumers as having helped pay for it. You're a sponsor of the study uh, that was presented. Uh, MyQuest Michigan Entrepreneurship Scorecard, uh, empowering Michigan's entrepreneurs. So, since you helped pay for it, I assume it's a pretty reliable indicator of where we are. And according to the study, Michigan's electricity rates per kilowatt hour are 34th in the nation, and only Wisconsin is higher uh, in the Midwest in terms of rates. And a few pages later, after, what now, seven years of operating under the 90% monopoly system, according to this study, which you guys helped pay for, it's got your logo on the front, uh, Michigan is 49th most reliable in terms of its electricity system in the United States. Uh, only South Carolina is less reliable. And I remember the narrative last term being that unless we had a regulated market, we couldn't be guaranteed of having sufficient electricity in the future. So for the last eight years, we've had 90% monopoly guaranteed market with a guaranteed profit share. And yet we're 49th most if, uh, reliable in the nation, according to a study you helped pay for. So can you comment on what I view to be a disparity in that narrative last year? We've got some of the highest rates in the country and next to highest in the Midwest, and yet we're almost the least reliable electricity system in the country. Sure. So uh, thank you for asking that, because I think this is uh, a commonly misunderstood and um, uh, a good thing for us to talk through and understand together. Um, we have on the slide, presented on the projectors, I think you can see behind me, um, uh, the difference between rates and bills. And this is an important um, uh, thing for us to understand together. Uh, as you can see on this chart, uh, it shows um, Texas, Ohio, and Michigan. In states where there's more air conditioning load, you have more energy consumed and therefore your cost per unit is lower. However, in Michigan, we don't have the high uh, number of air conditioning days, though we still have to be prepared for the days that are those high air conditioning days. So we do have, the, in fact, it's going to be in the 80s today. Uh, we do have days that, that really tax our system and go all the way to peak load. And so on those days, we pay um, for that infrastructure, but we build that into the rates that are throughout the year. But if you look at the total expense of a family, what do they pay? People pay lower bills in Michigan. Our bills are lower in a year than our, 
than the rates would imply. So if you just compare state to state in a, per unit, that's not actually what customers pay. What they pay is the total bill and how much they use. And so because of our energy efficiency programs and because of our low air conditioning load number of days, our rates are a little higher, but our total bills are lower. And so in fact, our total bills are eight, anywhere in the last several years between 8 and 15 percent below the U.S. average. So we don't think rates are the right gauge. We think bills are the right gauge because that's what our customers actually are out of pocket and what percent of wallet uh, is exercised. Now on the reliability front, um, that study only talks about major event days. And so it's really more an indicator of weather than it is reliability. And the EIA standard uh, and the IEEE standard that we use to reference our performance, I think, Tim, if you go to slide 34, they can see our electric reliability. This slide's a little hard to read, but let me describe what it tells you. It talks about the frequency of outages, how many times in a year a customer is interrupted. The red is fourth quartile, orange is third quartile, yellow is second quartile, and green is first quartile of all utilities. Frequency of outage. We're the blue bar. Our blue bar shows that we're at 1.1 frequency of outages, and the U.S. average is 1.3. So in other words, on average in the U.S., people have more outages, more frequent outages than they do in Michigan, and specifically consumers, energy customers. So 1.1 means about one outage per year. We're continually improving that, and in fact, this year already, year to date, we're less than one in spite of uh, the major events that we've had this year. So that's a, it's a more industry standard, and it more reflects a total customer experience, not just during a single major event day. I, I can't help but offer the commentary that this is another example of something I've found very frustrating for the last two years. I imagine the rest of the committee does, is opposite sides of this issue use the same sources and come up with data that says exactly opposite things, and then we're left, those of us who have no experience in the industry, to choose who do we trust. Cause right. The numerous studies, including, this, including this one, indicate we have one of the worst track records in the country, and you're telling us we're below the national average. So not, yeah. I'm not questioning what you're telling me. I have no reason to believe anybody's purposely misleading us. It's just that we keep getting data from both sides that say exactly the opposite things, and sometimes it's, it cites the same source. So it's a, it is a source of frustration. Representative Barrett, I know you have a follow-up question on this particular question. I, I did. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess it's kind of like a, a political ad. They use the same source and claim two different outcomes, maybe. <laughs> but um, uh, if you could go back to that slide you just had about the rates versus bills, um, the uh, I guess just to follow up on that, I, I, I kind of view your rate sort of like for an individual, what what a gallon of gasoline costs? That's your rate, right? A gallon of gas is two twenty-five a gallon, or two fifty, or two bucks a gallon, whatever it happens to be. Your bill is how much you consume. So that's how many miles you drive and the fuel economy of your particular vehicle. I think that an individual has some control over, you know, what their bill is based on their consumption. They can't control their rate, just like an individual can't control what a gallon of gasoline costs, but they can control how much they consume within reason based on how much they drive and what type of vehicle they own. Similarly, in your own home, if you have more efficient appliances, if you have more efficient um, uh, you know, light bulbs, other things like that, or if you choose not to run your air conditioner as heavily at different times of day or, or what have you, then you can affect your overall bill. I think the point being, if, if the rate is higher, you can't control what that rate is. You can control how much you consume, so you can control your bill by that portion of the formula, but you can't control what the rate actually is. So I think that um, we may have lower bills, but I also think that there's a validity to the fact that our rates may be higher than some other states, um, you know, similarly to how someone, you know, my neighbor might drive a eight mile per gallon, you know, Hummer, and I might drive a, you know, some, you know, wind powered car or something like that. So. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if that, uh, if you have any commentary on that. I, I do. I, I'd like to just add that um, what's important to understand about what goes into the rate is what makes up the cost. And so what makes up the cost is the infrastructure that we get pre-approval for. That's, uh, you'll hear forward test years, right? We pre-approve the, um, or a certificate of necessity. We're going to build this asset 
for the sake of the infrastructure. And so we have a public process in Michigan to make transparent that we all agree we're going to invest in that asset and we're going to spend this much for it. And that's what drives the rate. So it's a decision that we make for infrastructure and infrastructure investments. And to serve a peak day one day a year versus every day of the year, it's the same cost, it's the same infrastructure for one day versus every day. And so I think in this scenario, it's slightly different than the, the gasoline uh, example. It really is about the infrastructure required to serve a peak day, because I think we would agree, even on the hottest day of the year in Michigan, we want the lights to stay on. And so given that, we have to serve that low. But here's what's interesting about this point in time, and this is why I think we are at an inflection point. We're going to replace those large assets. They're, they're retiring. And we have choices about with what we replace it. We are strongly advocating for the energy efficiency and demand response components of the energy bill that was passed uh, because it allows for us to reduce the cost of that infrastructure. Because I'm just going to come back to one thing, and, and you might find me a broken record on this. We want what you want. We want competitive prices in Michigan because that's how our business will succeed. And our, our business success depends on our prices being as low as possible. Therefore, right now, at this time, we couldn't um, prematurely retire those plants. It would be wasting customers' money. But they're at their natural end of life. We can retire power plants, replace them with demand response, energy efficiency, more modular sources of generation that lowers the total cost for customers. And we actually have a pretty great track record on reducing our fuel and operating expenses as a part of that uh, total cost for customers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll have another question later. Right. That's okay. okay. But, Thank you. Uh, you down. could add me to the list. Yep, we did. Um, Ms. Poppy, a uh, follow-up about the demand response. PSC did a study, I think in January, said they think they can el eliminate the ne need for 2,000 megawatts uh, a year just from demand response. And in your filing, as I understand it, or your communications to the PSC about the closure of the Palisades plant, which I'm going to turn over to Representative, which I'm going to turn over to Representative Griffin in a minute. My apology. Um, <coughs> that you told the PSC there was not likely to be any capacity question in Michigan because of the closure of the Palisades plant. At least that's my understanding. Uh, so the PSC says we're not going to need new generation, new plants because of demand response and the closure of Palisades you don't think is going to have any impact on capacity. That was something filed I think in January. But only a couple of months before uh, witnesses including yourself to the Senate uh, Energy Committee had predicted this brownout, you know, threat and capacity uh, problem. Uh, so I'm wondering what changed in a two-month period where when we had an energy bill before us along the narrative of you've got to allow us to keep our 90 percent monopoly, otherwise we're going to have a shortfall, which everybody thought meant shortage when it didn't. Um, and when that legislation was before us, we were told we're going to run out of energy within a couple of months before the new bill even took effect, we're being told that, hey, we can shut down a fully operational nuke plant, 800 megawatts, no problem. And just by demand response programs, we can save 2,000 megawatts, and that'll prevent us from having to build any new plants to replace some of these coal plants. What happened in that two months to so drastically change the narrative? Well, thank you for that question, Chairman, because this, again, is an important issue. Um, our narrative didn't change, actually. What we believed then and we believe now is that we were always prepared to provide for the 90 percent that we serve. That we have a, a long-term strategy and we have a replacement plan for Palisades. We always knew that Palisades' uh, PPA contract ended uh, in 2022. And, and uh, we had planned on 2022, but when Entergy decided to close the plant early, we could pass some additional savings earlier onto consumers' energy customers. So we had a backfill plan for Palisades. That was always in our plans. What we were describing as the risk in going into the energy law negotiations were the risk of alternative energy suppliers not having access to excess capacity. 
So in the past, there was abundant supply. Remember all those power plants I talked about that were built in that post-war era and uh, additional renewables were added. We had a lot of infrastructure that's retiring. We knew we would have enough to serve our 90 percent, but it was not clear without the 2016 energy law who was going to provide for that remaining 10 percent. This is a very uh, important issue, and it would continue to be an issue in the absence of the 2016 energy law. And in fact, at that time, MISO had actually even attempted to correct it at the FERC. They had applied for a three-year forward auction, and FERC denied it uh, because they said that uh, the hybrid markets um, are not MISOs uh, to manage. And so, thankfully, we passed the energy bills uh, at the end of the year. Michigan passed and the legislature passed those energy bills at the end of 2016 so that we do have visibility now into who will be providing the power for that remaining 10 percent. And that's what would cause the, the gap and the uh, potential shortfall in Michigan uh, in the absence of the energy law of 2016. So that was very important policy. We believed it then and we believe it now. Is there any reason Michigan could not bid out that responsibility to be the provider of last resort, which I believe Illinois does and I believe Ohio does. In fact, DTE won it in the competitive bid in Ohio, uh, yeah. at least for part of the supply, if I understand correctly. Well, Chairman, I would argue that the energy law does, in fact, uh, do that, but it's even more choice. Uh, the alternative energy supplier has choices about how to fulfill their obligation to serve their customers. So they've sold contracts to customers. They can choose to build something. They can choose to do a bilateral contract with someone. And if they don't, then they choose for the utility to serve that load. And their customers are then assigned a charge for the facilities that their customers will be utilizing. So I would suggest that we even have more choices in the energy law that was passed in 2016 uh, than just doing a bidding process for one big supplier of all. Every alternative energy supplier in this scenario has a choice of who, want, who they want to fulfill their obligation to serve their customers. Ms. Poppy, I appreciate your endorsement of the concept of choice in the electricity market, so thank you. Uh, and I'm going to turn over uh, for... Uh, 10, 15 minutes, however long she thinks necessary. I like to think that my district is, we got the most valuable company in Michigan at $61.1 billion, biggest employer, and electricity is the biggest source of doing business. And right next door is the biggest uh, gas fire producer of electricity and steam in North America. And 15 miles away is the single biggest consumer of electricity in Michigan, uh, Hemlock Semiconductor. I like to think my district's kind of sensitive to electricity, but nobody is as sensitive right now as Representative Griffin's district. So we're going to provide her wide latitude. I know you've come prepared to talk as much in depth as necessary about Palisades. So Representative Griffin, if you would take it from here. Thank you, Chair Glenn. I appreciate it. And um, also thank you, um, Patty, for coming today. And and. I do admit, as a, you know, a freshman on the Energy Committee, this is a lot of information. And I, as I looked up at your slide, um, <laughs> I just made a mental note to myself to ask you directly. We're going to have access to this yes. PowerPoint after, yes, right? Because this is stuff we have to study after everything else is coming at us. You okay. Bet. Thank you. And um, two questions be about reliability in general. Uh, before I delve into three or four questions about Palisades, so I'm just kind of give you a a little bit of a heads up of where I'm going first. Would you please repeat, and, and I think this is, this is for my good, but also for, I, I believe, a lot of us who would appreciate you repeating the information about um, the relationship between uh, FERC and states, and if you're a deregulated state versus a regulated state, and how FERC interacts differently, whether you're a regulated or a deregulated state. You bet. So, uh, and th this, um is complicated and it really uh, is worthy of question and dialogue. Uh, so the FERC regulates any state power provider that does not have a, a state regulated construct and interstate power transfers. So um, our very own ITC, the transmission companies, are regulated by FERC, not by the MPSC. But MPSC in Michigan has a construct, so they have authority over the state energy providers, DTE and Consumers Energy. FERC has authority over um, non-regulated states, power producers, and transmission. 
And so they, they, take, they step in when a state determines that they don't want a regulatory construct. The legislature passes, the legislature has to decide to pass legislation to deregulate. But what they really are deciding is that we want FERC to regulate. Uh, sometimes people refer to it as wholesale markets. It's just the generation and supply of energy. And so FERC has jurisdiction over that only in the event that there's not a state regulatory construct. When there's a state regulation, like there is in Michigan, FERC doesn't have jurisdiction over the energy provider, but they do have over jurisdiction trans over transmission. Okay, thank you. Just because as we, you know, we, we take our responsibility extremely seriously here, and we're trying to develop, I think, a philosophical groundwork, if yeah. you will, uh, some roots down into uh, the history and the context and, and um and the groundwork through which we'll make decisions in the future, yeah. right? Yes, of course. And, and so you're telling me that, you know, <laughs> as a free market gal, that even if a state, for example, use the example of Montana, uh, is, um, embraces choice, there's still FERC that regulates at the, at, the, at the federal level, so there is no true free market, free market energy Correct. construct right now because of the federal reg. Yes, and from one free market gal to another, I appreciate the challenge in this. And when I transitioned, I've spent the first 15 years of my career at General Motors. Total free markets, and trust me, it was dog eat dog every day. And I came to the utility and I thought, what in the world is going on around here? And then I discovered that it's vital infrastructure. It's vital infrastructure that we expect to be delivered to every home in America. We expect, as part of a modern society, that energy be available and accessible and affordable and providers are held accountable. And what was decided back in 1935, my only reason for this trip down memory lane is because it was helpful to me when I had to learn the first time myself, why is this market like this? Because it's vital infrastructure, local regulation is more likely to hold accountable local providers. And so we talk about a regulated market, but in this scenario, it talks about what it means is we're not motivated by profit maximization because we have state regulatory accountability. And so over the decades and, and 100 years that we've been under that construct, we have developed um, a commitment and rules and laws in Michigan that make sure that the, the deliverers of this vital infrastructure are not operating in a profit maximizing mindset. We're operating in a duty to serve. We consider ourselves almost like the military. We're not putting our lives on the line per se. So it's not, uh, we're not at all to the standard of the military, but the mindset of a duty of service. And when people are taking shelter, our crews are heading out. And when a building's being evacuated, our crews are heading in and securing the scene. But that mindset is that because it's a vital infrastructure, it should be regulated locally, and accountability and authority should be held locally. However, as a backstop, FERC will step in to assure that we have infrastructure that works across the nation. But they don't care so much about prices. They care about making sure that the system is reliable. Mm -hmm. And so that's why prices are higher in deregulated, deregulated, federally regulated states. Prices are 28% higher because the FERC does not care as much about price. They care about making sure that there's fair access to the market so that the lights stay on. And so that's why the state regulatory construct really is important and the billions of dollars that are invested in this state alone would not get the attention and the accountability by one agency in Washington DC and that's what they learned in 1935 that this one agency could not keep an eye on these big holding companies all across the nation and they made a decision then to give the authority back to the states. States rights actually end up being a better construct than federal regulation in this critical infrastructure. Okay. Thank you. Um, so my next question has to do with, um, again, 50,000 foot level energy and the reliability and the mi energy mix moving forward. And how do you see in an increasing reliance on natural gas affecting long-term cost of stability of um, electricity? It's a great variable. It's a big variable in all of our forward forecasts. 
Uh, what we can tell you is as we look at, at, now remember, we don't produce natural gas. We just deliver it. So we buy natural gas and use it to fuel our power plants or to our homes across the state. We store it here in Michigan, but we don't produce it. Um, uh, so we're buying from producers. And so we have a lot of conversations with those producers. And it is the wild card. Um, my former mentors used to say, if you can tell me what natural gas prices are going to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, you can win uh, the lotto. Like, there's, nobody knows. But what we can tell you and what the producers tell us is that the access to natural gas now in America is extraordinary. They would tell you virtually unlimited. And so right now, producers have capped wells where they could extract natural gas, but it's not economic because the prices are so low. So if prices did start to creep up for natural gas, all they have to do is open wells that are already ready to go. They're already drilled and ready. They're just waiting. So we have a, a forward forecast that shows that natural gas prices will be very stable for a long time. And so we think it's an important part of a, a generation mix, but we would never want to go all natural gas. And so our generation fleet is actually made up of hydro, we still have a couple very important uh, coal plants uh, that are, are using the best available uh, control technology for environmental emissions, and we have um, uh, renewables, all that make up with our gas uh, a pretty balanced portfolio to hedge fuel prices in the future. Representative Griffin, can I, uh, we've got eight other people that want to ask more general questions. Okay. Um, I want to defer to you, if you could, to hone in on yep. Palisades in particular because of the impact on your district. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, could you provide an update on your search for the natural gas plant to buy? Because we've been hearing you. Yes. Looking. Um, okay. uh, we have uh, issued an RFP. Now, that, is being, uh, that process is being conducted by a third party, so I can't illuminate much. Uh, because that's going through a process because of what's called affiliate transaction rules. Uh, our non-utility, non-regulated part of our company owns a power plant in Dearborn that will be bidding in that auction. And so because of that, we have to keep an arm's length to that auction proceeding, and that's why a third party is conducting it. Uh, we'll know by the end of July um, what the results of that auction are, and we'll be filing that with the Public Service Commission as part of our replacement strategy for Palisades. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Consumers has indicated that an early termination of the PPA will re result in cost savings for customers. Yes. Will anyone actually see a rate decrease on their bills at, at, in my district? The way that that will work. Patty, just for benefit of the committee, PPA, Power Purchase Agreement? Right, so we have a long-term power purchase agreement with Palisades, and the, this um, decision by Entergy to retire the, the plant early uh, meant that uh, we were going to negotiate the retirement of that securitization or the retirement of that uh, early termination of the PPA. So the early termination of the PPA requires approval by the Public Service Commission if we want to securitize that, which is a way of funding it so ratepayers don't have to pay for that in a big, and we don't earn on, um, we don't earn a profit on that, that payment. But the way that we'll, it will work is because it's in the $172 million range, what it will do is it will fund, uh, the savings will fund and be an offset to capital investments that we'll be making. So it would be rate um, increases that are lower than would otherwise be true. So uh, no one will get a rebate check. It won't work like that, but it will be built into the total cost of upgrading the infrastructure that I've been describing, and it will fund a portion of that uh, without us earning on it. So that's an important distinction. That savings we're passing through to customers' prices, but it won't show up in a, a rebate check. It will be built into the rate structure. So am I hearing you right? I'm trying to follow. Yeah. You, they will not see a rate decrease. They will see a leveling out of rates over time? Yeah, it'll be factored into all of our forward-looking rate proceedings, but when you look into the guts of a rate proceeding, uh, you will see it's about $45 million of savings per year, and we do annual rate filings, and our rate cases are typically in the $100 uh, million range. So you can imagine that a rate filing would be much lower than that with, the, uh, uh, with that savings built into it. 
but it won't be a refund. Could, could I jump in? Yes, for a please, Tim. Okay. So what will happen on uh, customers' bills is there's a there's a line item on a customer bill called a power supply cost recovery factor or PSCR, and that factor will go down, meaning that we will ultimately bill customers less going forward. Every year we have to file a five-year plan with the Michigan Public Service Commission of what our power supply costs are going to be, and we have to do that by September of every year. And so we did that last September, and it did not initially include um, the savings from the early termination of the Palisades Power Purchase Agreement. Once we came to agreement with Entergy on that, we filed supplemental information on that, and if you go from one to the other, you'll see that our power supply cost recovery costs went substantially down going forward for the next five-year period because that's the period that we file in that case. So customers will see an immediate decrease starting on June 1 of 2018 as part of their bill that power supply cost recovery will be less than what it otherwise would have been had Palisades come. Tim, why don't you bring up slide nine, uh, if, if you'll humor us, Chair, to talk about what makes up the total rates. That's what, this is part of the uh, question I think that you're asking, uh, Representative Griffin. If, if you look at the cost components, so the fuel and power cost, that blue bar uh, on this stacked bar, is where you would see the cost of a PPA, a power purchase agreement. So in this case, this is where the cost of the Palisades payment that we make every year and have been making uh, and our other power purchase agreements. We have uh, several of what are called PURPA power purchase agreements and we have another large one with uh, MCV. That section, you can see uh, over on the right side of the slide that our fuel prices have gone down since 20, 2011 and they'll go down further with the elimination of this, what we refer to as an out of market. It's a high priced PPA. We can buy power on the market for cheaper, we can produce it. Uh, and that's why we're doing this RFP for a new gas plant that we could produce power for less and save our customers in this PSCR. What's important to know, that is not a profit generating portion of the rates. PSCR? Right. Public, uh, power supply cost recovery is a pass through. So whatever savings we can achieve there, it does reduce bills. But in the meantime, other things are going up. So over the same time period, 2011 to 2016, the cost of our, our power purchase agreements actually went up $137 million. Our fuel cost went down, but the cost of the PPA, uh, uh, the power purchase agreement went up. A cost of transmission went up $100 million over the same time period. Those are things that we actually don't have control over. We don't, other than to have control over doing an early termination on an out-of-market power purchase agreement, but that's a transaction that has to be agreed to by both the supplier and, and us because we signed a long-term contract with them. And so um, these, it's important to know that these prices, this part of the bill is going down. Our operating costs of running the utility are going down. We have reduced our operating expenses more than any other utility in the country. We have reduced our operating expenses and in fact in the last four months We've had no less than a dozen uh, other utilities from around the nation come to Jackson, Michigan to come see us to ask us, how are you doing these cost savings? Mm -hmm. We have a great reputation. I would attribute it to a couple things. Number one, uh, our lean operating system is helping us to reduce costs, but we've also done structural changes to our costs to continue to reduce them, and we have a real tenacity. In fact, we have a, uh, what we refer to as a rally room we don't want to call them war rooms because we don't want to scare people. Uh, we have a rally room around cost reductions because we know, and I'm just going to come back to the fundamental theme. We win when Michigan wins. When our rates are most competitive, we can attract businesses to come to Michigan. We want our prices to be very competitive so that Michigan continue its momentum to attract and grow. And so I can tell you every single day we are working on reducing our costs and our prices. It is complicated when you look at this stacked bar uh, that there's a lot of factors that go into uh, a customer's bill and the Palisades PPA is one piece of it. Okay. And thank you. One more That's question, one more, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your indulgence today. Um, should the, the PSC reject 
the request for the early termination of the power purchase agreement for Palisades. What does consumers see happening and then how would that impact customers in my district? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I can't precisely predict what Entergy will do because it is their decision. It is our belief and in the negotiation process we believe that it was clear that if we didn't terminate the PPA early with an agreed upon payment, they would keep the plant running um, for the duration of the agreement, so till 2022, which would obviously keep those folks working until 2022. But at 2022, at the termination of that contract, the power plant will still close. And so that, that is our understanding. I can't I uh, guarantee you what Entergy will do, but that was our understanding in the negotiation. So when they came to us and said they wanted to retire the plant early, we were willing to help offset some portion of that contract that we had signed with them in order to save Michigan customers and accelerate our cost reductions in Michigan so that we can make our rates more competitive. That was our 100% driver, saving our Michigan customers dollars on their energy bills. It does nothing for our profitability. It doesn't change the financial status of our company. It just makes our customers' bills more competitive. Thank you, Patty, for your, for your indulgence and, thank you. and information. And I may have some more questions, but at this time, I, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your indulgence you today. And I will be looking at your PowerPoint uh, later. We, we welcome <laughs> the opportunity to discuss it further. Thank, yes, you. thank you. Thank you, Representative Griffin. And we certainly want to be aggressive about doing whatever we can to mitigate the effects. Because what are you talking about? 30% of the revenue of your local governments and 600 jobs? Is that what's at risk? I uh, will. Uh, I'm sorry, Chair, for excuse me for interrupting. We um, we are working to redeploy those people into our company. Uh, we see there's probably around 200 of them that have the qualifications and the skills. We we retire 400 people a year uh, because of the age of our workforce, and so we're working closely with the plant. Uh, we know many of those people, and we would love to have them on the consumers energy team. So uh, certainly, we're trying to mitigate the effect of that as well. Ms. Pop, is it correct that the, by law you're guaranteed a certain profit? No. No? It is not. No. Our, um, we ha there's a thing called um, return on equity, which is authorized by the commission, but what it really depends on is the investments that we make in infrastructure, that we pre-approve and pre-agree that we're going to make those retirements, and reducing our costs to create the headroom for profitability. So our profits are driven by our ability to most efficiently deploy that capital. Are you allowed to adjust your rates in order to hit that authorized return on investment? We establish our rates forward looking. And so we do that forward test year that you might be familiar with. And that sets our rate. And throughout the year, that is what the rate is. Now, we do true ups on uh, power supply cost recovery and our gas cost recovery because those are just pass throughs. They're not, uh, we don't earn on those. And so those are uh, trued up. Okay, so you're given an authorized rate of return and you can make adjustments to make sure you hit it. No, we don't make adjustments to make sure we hit it. We save costs to make sure we hit it. We have to reduce our costs in order to achieve its. Um, uh, that's the only way we can do it. If we overspent, we would not achieve uh, the re return on equity. We wouldn't, return, we wouldn't achieve the profitability. The ROE is consistent, but we wouldn't achieve the profitability if we overspent. And so our objective is to reduce our costs, just like all businesses. Uh, we have a rate that is established that is a return on equity for the capital that we invest, which is all the infrastructure. And again, we get pre-approval for that. So that's the thing about the regulatory construct. Uh, we don't get to spend and then come back rearward and say, hope you like what we did. We do forward test years. That was passed in 2008. That's an important part of our regulatory construct in Michigan that really holds us accountable. We say we're going to do XYZ work, and the commission agrees that XYZ work is appropriate at that price for customers in Michigan. And then we go ahead and do it. And if we can do it more efficiently, if we can save uh, costs in that exercise, if we can make our work more efficient um, by improving processes, et cetera, then that's how we assure that we achieve our profit targets. Now, the committee may remember we were 
told in an earlier hearing with a bait that in fact the uh, PSC whatever the authorized rate of return on investment is that the utilities have gotten more than that have been have received a greater degree of return on investment than what was authorized and they told us that there were tens of millions of dollars that were projected to be spent that there was no evidence it was so left the question of if that's what you were supposed to be expending where did no. the money so go? I would say um, a couple of things. In the last eight years, on average, we actually under-earned the ROE, uh, the re return on equity. Uh, yeah, I guess you can look at slide 31 that shows that. Um, it's important to weather adjust that because if you have a really hot year, and here's, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to explain this in a way that's understandable, but um, throughout a calendar year, We'll, we'll have an investment plan, we'll have infrastructure that we plan uh, to upgrade, uh, we'll have projects that we want to do. And if, let's say, uh, the weather, it's a really hot summer and people are using more electricity, we take the favorability from weather <coughs> and put that back into the business. We don't give it to shareholders. And again, this is part of our commitment. It's one of the things that um, our, our investors actually appreciate because we're very reliable in our financial performance, but our customers appreciate it because we put those dollars, for example, we would do more tree trimming or we would do substation maintenance accelerations or a power plant outage, we would pull ahead and accelerate maintenance if we have favorability in a year. And I can't tell you how many earnings calls I've been on where investors have said, hey, Patty, it's getting warm out there. Don't you think that, you know, you should sweeten our profits this year? And we say no. Nope. Those are going back to customers. And uh, we're one of the few utilities um, uh, who has that track record uh, with our customers and our investors. And it's one of the things that they appreciate about us. We make a promise to investors who are, by the way, fixed income retirees who have put their life savings uh, entrusted to us. Our investors aren't big Wall Street fat cats. They're moms and pops who have put their investment and their life savings in our hands so that we can fund our investments in infrastructure in Michigan, and we make a promise to those people that we'll provide them an adequate return, and we make the same promise to customers that we will deliver an adequate service. We are what I would describe in a stage of actively working to improve our customers' experience um, through our lean implementation. But it's um, uh, over earning. Um, is really Ms. Poppy, this is one of these uh, precise points of frustration, and you and I have had this conversation. I think at some point in the future it would be helpful for the committee to have you and somebody from Abate sitting in the same room at the same time, because now we're left to decide is one major corporation consumers telling us the truth, or are a group of multiple uh, major corporations and employers like Amway and Dow Chemical and U.S. Steel and Marathon Oil, are they telling us the truth? How do we know? It's a major point of frustration. They come and testify that you've over, been overcompensated. You say you've been undercompensated. I guess either way you hadn't hit the target. Uh, it, it raises the question of why you should be allowed to charge rates to rate payers, because that's who we're supposed to represent, based on projected costs instead of actual costs, rear view mirror. Um, but I hope you will consider the possibility at some point in the future of letting us be the audience to a give and take between these competing factions, well, Bo I, both of which have, you know, sh have some expectation of credibility in our eyes, here's and yet the good be news. being told exactly the opposite. Every rate filing, you can have that audience, because that's the great thing about a state regulatory construct. Abate intervenes in every rate filing. They're public. The, the proceedings are public, the hearings are public. We do debate it publicly every single time we make a filing, and then it is the commission's jurisdiction and job to wade through all of that to determine what is in the best interest of the Would people. Would you be willing to come do that before us? Well, you know, I, I don't know. We, have, we do it a lot. <laughs> There's plenty of opportunity. It would be helpful for it. us if you'd be willing to come do it before us. Vice Chair Howard. Yeah, thanks, uh, Patty. Could you go back to the, the slide that had the rates? The and the bills? Yeah. Yeah. Slide 11. This one? Yeah. yeah. Um, the one question I have, and then my background is um, I worked in a factory for 25 years, 
and there's a lot of people there that, like it or not, live paycheck to paycheck. So energy cost is one of the most expensive things they face. Now, I'm, I'm kind of in line, you know, with Tom. Obviously, if you live up north where Bo lives, you're not going to use your air that much, right? But to me, we're missing the point here because the rate is the rate is the rate. If our rate was 11.6 cents per hour, then that would be less than $1,123, right? Um, I think the part that is, um, we're not doing a good job explaining is that what drives the rate. It's the cost for that infrastructure to make sure on that one hot day the power plant has enough uh, availability. No, I, nope, I, I understand that. And then the other thing, like I said, I'm, I'm new to the energy, so I'm just, you know, I kind of went from working in a factory to boom, hey, here's this complex energy issue. And I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express once, so I am becoming an expert. <laughs> but, but I worked and, in factories for 15 <laughs> years, so I totally get your vibe. No worries here. Uh, but, and to be honest, I'm not sure where I set on the deregulation or regulation yet, you know, because I'm, I'm still learning. But up here, you're showing me, and again, coming from the factory background, and electricity is the most expensive part in a, in a lot of people's households, is I'm looking at Texas and Ohio, who have cheaper rates than we do, and they're both um, not regulated. Am I correct? Right. So I guess... This is a mix. Texas has half regulated, half unregulated, and Ohio's in transition. Free market states. That's, free, what, you're, free that's, market, what, you're, free that's what you're looking states. for. But so I guess my, I mean, how can I argue to the people in my district not to deregulate when I'm looking at two states that are free market and they do have cheaper energy? Because those customers in Ohio and Texas are paying more. This is why the rate, the, the point of this slide is to say, look at how much their annual payment is. But aren't they, aren't they paying more because it's hotter in Texas and Ohio and they're, um, That's exactly and they're using right. more electricity? And in Michigan, like my house, I have natural gas for my furnace, right? Yeah. So that's going to bring my cost down because natural gas is cheap. But in Texas, where my uh, brother lives, they don't have a natural gas um, uh, compressor for their air conditioning. They use electricity. So even though the rate's cheaper, they're using more power because it's hotter down there, right? Right. This is a central, central question. And I, I really am um, very glad that you're asking it. And we need to tease it out because the point is the rate is, a, is an indicator of the cost of the infrastructure. And the same infrastructure that's required to serve Texas on one day is the same infrastructure that's required to serve Michigan on one day. And so it gets spread over less kilowatts, right? So less kilowatts used in Michigan makes the price per unit higher, but the total cost paid by the people in that state is less. And so I would come back to the fundamental question. Are our bills too high and they're eight to 15 percent below the U.S. average. The bills, what customers pay in Michigan. So can a business be successful here? Can a family be successful here? It's a lower percent of the wallet. I bet the wages at a GM plant in Flint and the wages in a GM plant in Texas are pretty similar, mm -hmm. right? And so customers in Michigan, those Flint UAW members, are paying less of their wallet for energy in Michigan. And so the question becomes, what problem are we trying to fix? And do we want to, at this juncture, with the momentum that Michigan has, say, let's hope that in a deregulated market we won't need so much energy infrastructure to serve the people of Michigan and maybe we'll have more air conditioning days in Michigan so that the rate looks the same as Texas. That, that's not going to happen. Right. Do you follow what I'm saying? The federal regulation then is the alternative to the state authority. And so I think that's the question. Do we believe that if we turn the keys over to the federal government, particularly the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, that prices will go down in Michigan? Do we believe that's true? And is there any evidence anywhere in America that when they deregulated, prices went down? And what we know is in deregulated or federally regulated states, prices are 28% higher and customer satisfaction is lower. And so that's the bet we'd be taking. And all the while we'd be taking that bet, we would have this policy churn. It took us years 
to get where we got in December of 2016. We can start that policy churn and leave businesses wondering what is going to happen in Michigan. Maybe we should just go somewhere else. Let's so, not take a bet on Michigan with all that churn. So that's what we're offering. That the, is the responsibility of this commission or this committee. Otherwise, there's no sense in having an energy committee right. for the next decade. Right. So it's important to understand, though, the choices that we're making uh, and the implications of those choices and what solution we're applying to what problem. You know this rally room concept I talked about? We have them for all of our important company goals, like uh, delivering on time for customers. We have a rally room. Electric reliability, we have a rally room. Cost, we have a rally room. These are all critical goals. I actually spend time, personally, in those rooms with the management team and with the people doing the work. And one of the most important things we do in that room is define the problem we're trying to solve, which I would suggest we as a state have an opportunity to do. What problem are we trying to solve? The problem I would offer is how do we make sure that we can make Michigan most competitive to attract the most businesses to come and locate in Michigan and grow here so that our guys can get back to work, all of our folks can have jobs, our kids and our kids' kids can have jobs here in Michigan, they don't need to leave. And I bet you've talked about that exact subject with your constituents. And so I think we have to define the problem that is the biggest barrier to companies coming here. And we're on a great track record. There's going to be more good news this month. I'm, I'm, I can't tell you more about it, but about some economic development news because we're on the front line. Michigan's got momentum. And I would suggest that uh, uh, we should maintain that momentum and keep working together and implement this energy law. And I think that would be a great role for this committee to play. Uh, and, and just to further, uh, Ms. Poppy, it is the duty of this committee to churn energy policy every session, not, <laughs> not just every decade. That's the whole point, or else we're all just spinning our wheels. And I can't help but continue to look to Ohio, lower rates, and we're told now 10 new plants under construction in Ohio. Ohio State says they saved $15 billion for ratepayers in the last five years, expressly because of electricity choice. So they're doing something over there that keeps their rates lower and generates new plant construction. We have the higher rates and haven't built a plant, I think, by the major utilities in 1985. So there's something going on over there that leads me, not knowing any more than I do, to say what is it they're doing that's working that's not going on in Michigan. I want to ask you one question, then I'm going to rush to get uh, as many of these other questions in. A year ago... Did you yeah. want to talk about... Yeah. Chair, did you want to talk about Ohio? We would love to talk about Ohio. We may have to bring you back, but yeah, okay. you can work it in. A year ago, you were telling us that when the MISO auction took the cost per megawatt from $4, I believe, up to $72, that that was an indication of a tightening energy supply market, and it justified us continuing the uh, the Granholm model with the monopoly model and all of that kind of thing. Uh, can you elaborate on why you think the price on the MISO market went from $4 up to 72 a year ago? Yeah, so uh, Tim, if you'll turn to slide 21. Uh, Tim is our MISO expert. I'll give you kind of a high level, but then I'd love to turn the floor over to him, especially so I don't waste his whole time, these guys, for coming here, and then I'm talking the whole time. Uh, uh, the MISO auction um, last year, when it was $72, indicated that, um, and let me just back up and say, the MISO auction, is not an auction or a market. It's an indicator of supply and resources in the entire MISO region. So it, it is not intended to be a market. It doesn't have, people don't bid in their true cost of generation. Regulated utilities will bid in at almost or nearly zero because they're fully recovered in their regulatory uh, environment. So they don't actually put actual prices. It's not an indicator of price. The bilateral markets are a much better indicator of price, and the bilateral markets are showing prices are rising. Bilateral markets are um, a power generator, an independent power generator provides a contract to someone to provide energy. That's a market. They're actually negotiating a contract. The MISO auction is not a market. It's just a, a, a job for MISO to do to confirm that resources will be available to supply the load. So, be careful about reading too much into the actual price. Though last year's auction... Can you tell us why it went from $4 up to 72 a year ago? Yes, yeah, so it's $1.50 this year. It was $72 last year. 
So, uh, Tim, why don't you talk through what drove that? We have a nice chart on this. Yeah, in general, what's happening in the MISO market is that almost 100% of the resources that are required to actually be committed to serve the load plus a 15% reserve margin are all provided by regulated utilities. So the reason why the MISO market is practically zero in cost is because all the regulated utilities are offering in their generation at no cost at all because they need to ensure that the MISO will pick their generation in order to confirm that they have it available for their load. And the only way to do that is to bid their generation in at zero cost. And everybody knows that a generator doesn't cost zero. It costs a lot of money. And so the regulated utilities get their costs paid for from their state utility commissions through their rates that their customers pay. So it's just this little extra at the very end of the resources that bid into the MISO that actually start to set the price. And that's usually um, from independent power producers that then bid into the MISO some cost above zero. And that's ultimately um, why you're seeing some of these prices fluctuate a little bit is because in, in different years, the amount of electric load that has to be served in a year goes up or down a little bit. The amount of generation that's available goes up and down a little bit. And the amount of electric transmission that's available to move that power around is constrained or not constrained. And so this particular past um, auction that occurred just a month or so ago, um, there, was a, there was a little bit less load that had to be served than the year before. There's a little bit more generation available than what was a year before, and the transmission constraints were a little bit lower this past auction, and that culminated in the price going from $72 down to effectively zero because it was easier to ship all of this effectively f free capacity around the grid to serve all of the load. I recall that uh, we were told last fall that uh, the reason it went from $4 to $72, it's all on tape, uh, committee members can go pull it up was because that was evidence of a constricting market, a constricting supply, therefore the price went up. And this year when it goes from $72 down to $1.50, it means something other than an indication of the availability of electricity. So that's what continues to be a point of confusion for me. But uh, Representative Lisinski, I want to make sure we get your questions in. Uh, thank you, Representative Glenn. I think uh, given the time, it may be appropriate for us to ask uh, consumers energy to come back on another day uh, given yeah, the, the volume yeah, of questions and the few that we've been able to make it through. So one of the things, um, if you wouldn't mind flipping back to the chart with the, the rate stack, the, sure. the description of how a rate, yeah, um, nine. How a rate is uh, compiled. Exactly. <coughs> Thank you. So looking at that, um, my question is around what are the different levers we can pull to lower rates? So looking at the fixed cost and the variable cost, understanding that the fixed cost in, as you've been describing, infrastructure, generation plant, is very hard to change on a dime. We have the transmission, we have the transmission uh, lines that we have, we have the fees associated with that, and we have our generation plants, and while we can be a little more nimble there, that still is a, a time-consuming and, and costly to change the generation. So um, what are the levers we can pull to lower rates? In particular, one that I'm interested in is around um, peak shaving of demand, that single day that we have to maintain the capacity for that causes us to increase our fixed, ba our, you know, our fixed yes. cost base because we have to have that sitting and ready because, as we all know, if it's going to be 85 degrees today, I'm hoping to have a comfortable night's sleep. Um, what are some of the other levers? Can you, can you talk about that demand shaving, that, that part of it? And what are some of the other levers that we can use to lower rates? Um, the demand response is an energy efficiency both uh, used to be theoretical because we had excess capacity. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about an inflection point in the industry, you're spot on. This, this point right now, while we're retiring units and demand and supply are, are more closely in balance, now is the perfect time to shave that peak. 
and help correct that uh, Michigan factor that makes rates look higher, that we can shave the peak and build out less capacity. Now, it requires that we replace then older capacity. So we, we tired seven of our 12 plants just last year, and we're backfilling that with a lower cost gas plant. That's part of how the blue bars up on the top right are showing a reduction. That, that was a reduction to transition from coal to, to gas, and we see more of that possible in the future. Our PPAs, however, our power purchase agreements, are a big cost driver. In our price rally room, we've got a Pareto chart, and a, a Pareto chart represents the biggest drivers to the gap, and our gap is trying to improve industrial rates specifically and lower customers' bills. The biggest bars are these power purchase agreements because they are fixed in nature, they're long-term in nature, and when we signed them, they were good. They were good agreements when we signed them, but the market has changed. And so one of the things we can do is transition away from PPAs to more uh, utility-owned and more demand response, more renewables, more modular additions of generation supply than building great big plants to one-for-one -one backfill old assets. And so that's our strategy. We actually call that clean and lean. Um, we think there's uh, an opportunity there. There's other things like um, personal property tax. Many other states have changed their policies on that. We pay $250 million for our assets. Other states have different um, configurations. That all goes into our rates. That's a policy driver of rates. And again, the, the PPAs. Those are the biggest bars on our bar chart, our Pareto chart for cost savings. So could you hone in on one of the points that you made there when you were talking um, about replacing energy? Um, we know that some renewables actually take the fuel cost to zero. Yes. So when, we're, when you're looking at replacing, you said clean and lean. Could you exp expand a little bit more and what you see the portfolio mix if you're at 10% renewables now, 10% oil, 8 nuclear, 34 natural gas, 24 coal? Um, how you see that chart shifting into the future. Yeah, this is um, a oh. good example <laughs> of how you. we see it shifting. And this is what's interesting to us as we look at this inflection point in our industry and why we would be so excited to work together with this committee on how to transform our energy portfolio. We see the opportunity to replace large central stations with more modular sources of energy, whether it's smaller, highly utilized gas plants. We... Um, purchased the uh, gas plant in Jackson. Instead of building a new one, we fully utilized this plant in Jackson, saved half a billion dollars for ratepayers in Michigan. We think adding now incremental renewables allows us to more modularly add. You can add 100 megawatts. It's pretty ineffective, inefficient to add 100 megawatts of gas. You can do a CT backup to manage peak, but you can do more renewables. Renewables are becoming more and more cost effective. We're becoming more and more cost effective at, in, at utilizing them. And so the fuel cost does go to zero for a renewable uh, resource. And when you can install it efficiently and have a small CT gas backup, you can just add enough generation, not take a big leap and hope we grow into it and everybody pays for that great big leap. But again, this is all something that would be part of a state regulatory discussion and construct, and part of the 2016 energy law included an integrated resource plan that would not exist if we deregulated. An integrated resource plan is an opportunity for all of us to weigh in on what we want that generation fleet to look like in the future, as well as competitive bidding on large projects, as well as continued access to retail open access. So I think there's... Um, a great opportunity for Michigan to really transform what our energy fleet looks like. And this is our point of view, but this would all be part of uh, public transparent proceedings. So last follow-up, Chair Glenn. So you're saying that without action from the legislature, you see that the cost of renewable energy, natural gas, and the cost of coal will drive you to, towards that pie chart you're showing there with a likely renewable target of 30%. I would say, Strictly based on the finances of the sources of energy. And I would say given the action taken from the legislature last year, okay. given that and the current economic conditions uh, in Michigan, we would be leading toward this future. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Poppy. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very quick question. Uh, you stated that you guys do not want to jack up prices. You want rates to be as low as possible. Just curious, when was the last time you pet uh, petitioned the MPSC for a rate decrease? 
Yes, we have not petitioned the commission for a rate decrease because what's made up in rates is this infrastructure that's all aging. And so this is the challenge for us. And, uh, you know, um, we think about the service, and I can honestly tell you, we think about the service of our most vulnerable citizens as well as our largest corporations. And if we didn't have to invest in infrastructure, then we wouldn't have to ask for rate increases. But we have to invest in new poles, in new technology, in new generation resources, in new pipes in our gas system. And so it's those investments. And that's why the forward-looking test years in the regulatory construct is actually quite good. I know it seems like, well, why don't you do it afterwards? Well, if we had spent it and then uh, got approval for it, maybe we would spend it on things that people didn't support. So we do forward-looking rate making, get approval for the infrastructure, and so that's what makes up our rate filings, is that infrastructure. Uh, quick follow-up. When was the last time there was a rate decrease? Yeah, I, I don't remember a time when there was a rate decrease. So rates will never decrease, they will always increase? I wouldn't say that they would always. Um, historically speaking, they have? Historically speaking, they have. Representative so Elder. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Poppy, for coming to testify today. Welcome. Um, I've got the honor of representing the 96th District, which uh, has one of your longest standing facilities. It's um, formerly known the, called the uh, Karn Wiedek plant. It's one of the largest taxpayers, one of our largest employers, and many of those employers are still members of uh, Utility Workers Local 144. So I want to thank you for the role that you're playing in my district. Uh, earlier this year, Chairman Glenn and I had the opportunity to tour the Hemlock Semiconductor Facility in Saginaw County, uh, which is, uh, although General Motors is the largest user of energy in the state of Michigan, uh, Hemlock Semiconductor's facility is the single largest uh, facility user. What can consumers in the state of Michigan do to help retain employers like Hemlock Semiconductor, given how important uh, the cost of energy is in their, in their portfolio? Yeah, th thank you for bringing up Hemlock Sem Semiconductor. They're a very important customer for us. Ms. Poppy, you got about two minutes at the most. Yes, sir. Uh, and so what I would say uh, is we are working actively as we speak with uh, HSC uh, to, to continue to work to make them successful. Uh, and in fact, just as in part of that pursuit, um, just last week we awarded them our largest energy efficiency incentive check ever awarded to any company in Michigan. It was $1 million for a new air handling system to make their operation more efficient. So they can use less energy and we incentivize them to do that so that we can help reduce the total structural cost uh, for our infrastructure in Michigan. And we're working very closely with HSC right now uh, to continue to find a way to best serve them because coming all the way back and in closing, we want what you want. We want HSC to win. We want Dow to win. We want Michigan to win. We want all of our companies to be able to stay here, grow here, create jobs for our families for years and years and years to come. And I would suggest that we are at an inflection point where we together can design what that energy future looks like so that Michigan can continue its momentum and keep winning. Ms. Poppy, appreciate you being here today. We've still got a backlog of questions. Hope you or the gentleman with you might be willing to come back and give us another crack. Great. Another shot at, uh, at that. I need a motion to approve the minutes of the last uh, representative. Uh, Tedder <laughs> makes that motion. And without objection, so ordered. Need a motion to excuse Representative Garrett. So moved. And without objection, so ordered. Energy Policy Committee stands adjourned. Thank you.